Uh, yeah, I'm a child of the early 70s, we'll put it that way, but my musical influences were from the 1980s. Any 80s music fans in here? You like the 80s? Now, I'm not sure if it was good music in the 80s or it just, it was a time and place thing, but uh, you know, you listen to it today and I'm not sure that it holds up, but I, I'm a child of the 80s, so my playlist is mostly music from the 80s or the 60s. It just seems to be where the split is. I have a lot of Beatles in my, my, uh, my playlist. I have a lot of 80s music, Huey Lewis and all that stuff, one of my favorite groups of all time, but I'm an 80s uh, child, so my playlist centers around that. But I like to sing my playlist. I like to, you ever, anybody sing in the car? You sing in the car, right? Um, <laughs> you, ever, you ever ride with somebody who doesn't know the words to a song, but they sing it anyway? You know what I'm saying? They just make up the lyric. They think, you know, and you're convinced that they, they, they know, but they really don't know the words. Like, for example, the, the one famous one by Elton John, the song Tiny Dancer, you know, Hold Me Closer, and if somebody doesn't know the words, they'll sing it, Hold Me Closer, uh, Tony Danza, the old actor, Tony Danza. Or how about this one, TLC from the, was it 90s, I guess, Waterfalls, you know the song, Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls? If I was riding with somebody, that, you know, and they, they sang it this way, Don't Go Jason Waterfalls. I don't know who Jason Waterfalls is, but they were singing, I'm like, it's not Jason Waterfalls, it's Chasing Waterfalls. Or the one from Bon Jovi, you know, living on a prayer, uh, you know, uh, got to hold on to for what we got. It doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. That's the lyric. I was riding with somebody the other day. They said, it doesn't really matter if we're naked or not. I'm like, trust me, it does. It does. It It does. You know, I'm a, like I said, my playlist is made up of a lot of Beatles tunes, and the Beatles, are the, they get their lyrics destroyed all the time. We think we know all these Beatles songs, but we really don't. But I want to make sure that you know at least one, because today we're going to discuss, we're going to unpack one of my favorite Beatles songs ever. Now, before we mess up the lyrics, I want to play it for you, at least a little snippet of it to give you a sample. See if you recognize it. Let's listen together. Here comes the sun. Yeah, Here Comes the Sun. One of my favorite Beatles tunes because whenever I'm feeling down, I put Here Comes the Sun on because it reminds me that no matter how dark my life gets, the sun's going to come back out, right? I love that song. It's a real upbeat tune, one of my all-time favorites because here's the deal. Sometimes life gets tough, doesn't it? Sometimes we all struggle. There's a challenge. We face our, we, we get up in the morning and we're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through today. And we need to put on a song like Here Comes the Sun to remind us that just because it's storming now doesn't mean it's going to be storming forever, that the sun will come back out. So we're going to unpack that song just a little bit. I hope you'll indulge me just a few minutes to kind of peel off some of these lyrics and look at them a little closer. Because I think, you know, you maybe you've been told there's two things guaranteed, death and taxes, right? We all hear that. I think there are three more, okay, that all of us inevitably will face. Here's the first one. In fact, I put it there in your notes if you're taking notes today. Let's look at the lyric first, okay? George Harrison sings, Little darling, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Notice the word there, lonely. Some of our lives feel like that long, cold, lonely winter. We struggle with, with loneliness. Please fill that in if you have taking notes. Everyone has times of loneliness. Everybody. Now, I'm not talking about being alone. Because some people like to be alone. They like to be isolated. Some of, the, my, some of the best conversations I've ever had have been alone. You, you, you feel me on that, right? right? Some of your best conversations. Somebody told me the other day that they, have, they like to get by themselves. It's the only intelligent conversation they have all day, right? <laughs> but being alone is not lonely. Lonely is not that. Lonely is an emotion. Lonely is the way we can feel even in a crowded room full of people. It's a disconnect from others. Now, if you've ever felt lonely before, you're in good company because there's someone in the Bible that feels the fact that we're going to follow the same person throughout all of our points today, King David. King David throughout the Psalms felt lonely. In fact, I put a verse there in the outline. It'll also be here up here on the screens. Psalm 25, 16, David says to God, turn to me and have mercy for I am what? I'm alone. And in deep distress. This is King David. This is the guy with thousands of Instagram followers and a crazy great Twitch channel. I mean, this is a guy who is connected. He is King David. And what does he write to God? I feel alone. God, where'd you go? God, why do I feel like I'm by myself? Why am I so lonely? If we're being honest, I think all of us can say that we felt those things. We felt lonely from time to time. I put it this way in the notes. Loneliness is the feeling that we are not loved, wanted, or important. It's a terrible feeling. 
that the earth is spinning and nobody seems to care that we're on it. That's the feeling of loneliness that we're talking about. That's what David felt in his soul. Some of us feel like that when we're with family. Some of us feel like that in our marriage. Our marriage relationship, we become more roommates than husband and wife. And we feel lonely. It has nothing to do with physical proximity. It has everything to do with the way we feel. Maybe we feel abandoned by God. Maybe we feel like, you know, nobody cares that we exist. But we feel lonely from time to time. If this is you, I have great news for in here in point one. Please fill this in. Number one, truth number one, you matter to God. You matter to God, he is always nearby. You matter to God, he is always nearby. One of my very favorite stories in all of scripture is when Jesus is going out to visit his disciples, you know, his boys. They're out on the boat and they're in the middle of this, this big water and Jesus wants to come out and see them and talk to them. What does he do? He doesn't take a little boat and kind of canoe out there. He walks on the surface of the water out to the boat. And Peter sees him walking, and Peter says, I want to do that, Jesus. And what does Jesus tell him? If you remember, in Matthew 14, he says, come on. Come on out, Peter. Just step outside the boat and walk to me. Jesus admired Peter's level of faith, and Peter does. Let's pick it up in Scripture, Matthew 14, starting in verse 29. It says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, what happened? He was afraid. And he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, you, can you imagine? Put yourself in Peter's position. Here he is. All the disciples are in the boat. And Peter takes that one step out. He puts his feet down on the water and the water holds him up. And he feels great. And he, starts to, he sees the wind and he starts to doubt. Life starts to get tough. He must have felt like the loneliest guy on the earth. They're all going to laugh at me. Is God going to save me? Does anybody care? He's all out there lonely. And I love what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't have to swim over to Peter, does he? Jesus doesn't have to step over disciples to get to Peter, does he? What does scripture tell us? Immediately, Jesus reaches down with his hand and pulls Peter back up. If you feel lonely today, never forget, Jesus doesn't have to come running. He never leaves. He'll reach down and grab you immediately and pull you back up. That's the God we serve. Now, oh, we struggle with this though, don't we? We get like David, God, where did you go? Don't you care about me? Immediately, Jesus picks up Peter. In the same book, a little further down, Matthew 28, it says this, Jesus says this, and be sure of this, I am with you, what? Always, that's from the Greek for Always, right? <laughs> Always. There's not a time in your life where Jesus takes off, even to the end of the age. I will be with you till the sun burns out and beyond, Jesus said. I'm always going to be with you. Immediately I'll pick you up. I'm never going to let you drown. I've got you. The truth is, you may not feel loved, wanted, or important, but you were important enough for Jesus to come down and sacrifice his life so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven. That's how much you matter. That's how much you matter. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he loves me. Do I always feel like that? No. Sometimes life gets super lonely, doesn't it? But Jesus promises us that I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to be with you till the end of the age. Here's the second thing I think will make us feel better if we're feeling lonely. Number two, not just that you matter to God, you also matter to us here at the local church. You are part of the familia. Now, I love this church. This is a great place to come and heal. And it's a great place to come and serve and to love others and be loved on by others and to connect you know, you might think, I have this special passion for connecting people to where they're best suited, where their gifts, you know, whether it be serving or connect groups or whatever. I love that. Here's why. Not because I'm trying to drive up some number, but because I know that through connection, loneliness disappears. That all of us can find that special place in this house, part of this familia, to remind us that God is never far away. You matter to God, you matter to us. Here's the second set of lyrics. We're going to leave loneliness behind and move on to the second thing that's guaranteed. You have death, taxes, loneliness. 
Here's the next one. Let's look at the lyrics first. George says, little darling, the smiles returning to the faces. Notice I'm not singing this to you. You're welcome. <laughs> little darling, it seems like years since it's been here. The smiles are returning to the faces. Has it been a while since you really smiled? I don't mean the smile you bring to work. I mean the, the real, that smile, that, just that joy, right? That genuine joy. Has it been a while? A lot of us experience this, and I want to ask you to fill this in, all of you, even at home, fill this in. Everyone has times of pain. Everyone has times of pain. It reminds me of that old REM song, and I'm going to sing this to you because there's only one word. See if you remember this song. Everybody. There you go. Thank you. It's a sing-along. You didn't realize this was interactive. Everybody hurts sometimes, right? Great song. Sad song. One of those songs you listen to when you're eating your haagen ice cream out of the pint, and your PJs, watching Netflix. Everybody hurts, right? But the truth is, we all do hurt, don't we? From time to time, we all experience pain, sometimes for a long, extended time. Whether it be emotional, physical, relational, spiritual, all of us experience pain from time to time. It's, it's part of the human condition. Now, let's go back to King David. Okay, King David, Psalm 13, 2, David says this, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? David's like, how long is this going to hurt, God? You ever feel like the world's winning? How long, how much longer is this going to go on? How much longer do people that even, that, how much longer are they going to win over, over me? Pain. Maybe you've asked God that same question. How long am I going to hurt? Why do I hurt so deeply? Am I ever going to feel better? Am I sentenced to this? Is this? Am I going to endure a life of pain? Here's God's response to that question or those questions. Two things he wants us to remember. Please fill this in. Number one, truth number one, pain is a part of the journey. Pain is a part of the journey. Now, I wish I had better news for you than that. I wish I could tell you pain, you know, you're exempt from pain, but pain is part of the journey. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, you will experience some level of pain from time to time. In fact, John 16, says it this way, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Notice the word will there. Not could, not should, not might, right? You will have times of trial and sorrow. It is coming for you. You will experience pain. If you're not experiencing it right now, thank God for that. But be prepared because more could be coming. Now, I wish I had better news for you, but it, you know, you've experienced it. You've been alive more than 10 minutes. You know that pain happens, doesn't it, from time to time? Well, there's hope. The Bible continues in 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter, chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised when pain comes. It's coming. Many of us spend an incredible amount of energy trying to avoid pain. Right? We don't get in relationships because the last one we had hurt us so deeply. Right? We don't share our real feelings because if we do, there's a vulnerability to that. So we stay sheltered. We just withdraw into the shell. We don't want to get hurt again. We don't take risks anymore because of the fear of failure. That's the one I struggle with, I think, the most. Is that fear of letting someone down. That pain that comes with that. Truth is, we just can't avoid it. I know this, pain makes us stronger and sometimes we need pain to, get, to be able to push through life, to get lessons we couldn't get any other way. In fact, I was reminded the other day, I was watching a nature documentary and it was a story of the butterfly. Any butterfly people in here, you like butterflies, flying worms, you like them? Aren't they pretty? Uh, but butterflies, when they're born, did you, have you ever watched a butterfly, I don't know, hatch? What's the right word? Any scientists in here? They, they, they burst from their cocoons. And when you watch it happen, it's a painful process to watch because they're pushing and kicking and you're like, oh, come on, butterfly, you can do it. And there's no way they're gonna be able to kick out of that cocoon. And then finally they do. But did you know that if you disrupt that process, if you slice open the cocoon for them, you will kill them? What? Why? Because they need the pain and the conflict and the pushing to be able to survive in the world. I think we do too. I think sometimes we need the pain to remind us, hey, you know, I, I, God has, has done amazing things in my life. It builds our faith. We build muscle pushing through challenge, don't we? 
I put this also in your outline. Suffering is a choice. Pain and suffering seem to go together. Pain is something, it's an inevitability, but choosing to suffer is a choice. It's an emotional response to the pain that we have. Because I think there's three different ways you can deal with pain. Number one, you can shake your fist at the heavens. Why me, Lord? Or you put your head down, you plow through it. Or you say, I'm going to use this pain as an opportunity to build my faith in God. I think a lot of us choose the first two. We don't see pain as an opportunity to strengthen our faith with God. We, we prefer to just blame someone for it or just stick our head down and just say, I'm just going just, I'm, I'm to get through it. I'm on my own power. We choose one or two. God says, I want you to lean on me to use that pain to strengthen your faith, to push out of that cocoon, to build your muscle so that when the next pain comes, you're, you're ready for it. You're stronger than ever because of what you've endured. In fact, I put it in my notes this way. Suffering starts when we shift from what happened to why me? We start wanting to put the blame. Oh, it's God, it's your fault, or it's my neighbor's fault, or my mother's fault, or we're still blaming our parents for the way we were raised, and we're, you know, 53 years old. It's like, hey, okay, yeah, you might have had a rough childhood, and I'm not downplaying that at all, but you're 53 years old. Leverage that pain. Is it easy? No. Kick out of that cocoon. Count on God. Pray. Connect with others. All kinds of ways of dealing with, with pain. And then sometimes we just choose straight up not to forgive. They hurt me so long ago that you just keep playing that scenario out in your mind, right? And they've long forgotten about it. But you keep bringing it up in your own head, bringing that pain right back up. Scripture tells us and that's a whole different message about forgiveness, but man, it's important to forgive. So we gotta decide, I'm gonna make the choice not to suffer with this, I'm gonna use it to leverage it, to learn about God, to grow closer to God, to strengthen my faith. That's what I'm gonna try to do with my pain. Suffering is experiencing pain, but sometimes we forget the purpose for it. In fact, I put this in the notes, God will use our pain for our good. God will use our pain for our good. Now, I wish I could tell you why you're experiencing the pain that you are. I, I don't know. I'm not God. But one day you'll know. One day you'll figure out, yep, you know what? That really was terrible when I went through it, but God used it in such a profound way. Man, I don't like learning that way, though. It's the school of two by four up the side of the head, right? I don't like that. Do you? I want to know exactly why do I hurt so bad? Badly, correct grammar. <laughs> why do I hurt so badly? God, why aren't you stopping this? I may not get that answer right away, but God's gonna use that pain for my good. Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that God causes everything, everything, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. There is a reason you're hurting. It will be soon revealed. And you'll be stronger for it. You ever notice that some of life's greatest lessons come from, come from the deepest hurts, the deepest pains, the things you've learned that stuck with you came from some of the deepest, most challenging pains you've ever faced? It strengthens us. Hopefully it teaches us not to repeat certain behaviors, you know? You know the reason you don't touch the stove when you're 30 years old? Because you did it when you were two. <laughs> or at least I hope. At least that's what we're counting on here, that you learn it hurts when you put your hand on the hot burner, right? Pain teaches us sometimes like that. What not to do. Mistakes not to make. People not to trust. I, here's the thing. I wish I could tell you how long to hold on. Like, okay, here we go. I know you're hurting. Hang on three more weeks and you'll be through this. I don't know how long it's going to take. Some of you have been hurting for years. But I know this, that God will reveal to you what the purpose of that pain was eventually. You're in a season of your life. It's not a life sentence. That pain will subside and you'll get clarity on it. Here's the second thing I wrote down. God will use our pain for the good of others. God will use our pain for the good of others. Uh, the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.4, Paul's writing to the churches in Corinth and here's what he says. He says he comforts us, Jesus does, God does, comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Sometimes your pain helps you help others in a much more profound way. You shift from sympathetic to empathetic. Because when somebody comes to you in pain, you can go, 
mm, I've been there. I feel that pain. I'm not just sorry for you that that happened. I've been there. In fact, my wife and I, we first got married. We tried to get pregnant and we couldn't. Five years we tried. And we went to doctors. And I'll never forget the look on my wife's face every single Mother's Day. Because she would just sit and cry. Because you know, after Mother's Day number one and Mother's Day number two and Mother's Day number three, you start asking questions like, okay, God, what did I do to tick you off? Who did I hurt? Why isn't this happening? We're watching people get pregnant left and right and we're not having, what's going on here, God? I, I, you know, my husband, we, we work at a church. We're, we're tithing, we serve. God, what is it gonna take? Why do we hurt so badly? But miraculously, we got pregnant with our daughter and can I just tell you the number of couples that we've talked to, prayed with, cried with, spent time with that are struggling with the exact same thing and we can look at them and hold their hands and cry with them and say, we've been, we felt that. Now at the time, the pain was, t- we hated it. But God uses it to help us help others at a deeper, more profound level. God will use your pain to help others. So pain strengthens us, it builds our faith, and helps us to more deeply connect with and help others. Here's our final set of lyrics. Once again, non-singing, okay? Uh, The Beatles say, Little darling, I feel that ice is slowly melting. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been clear. Lack of clarity. This scripture, this is scripture, and this isn't scripture. This is good music, not scripture. (laughs) This lyric talks about right? It's been years since it's been clear. How many of you guys use a GPS online? You can raise your hand. I can see you right there, right? How, use a, now, you use a GPS. Now, here's a bigger question. How many of you have ever argued with the GPS, <laughs> right? Right? They tell you where to go, and you're like, no, 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 no. GPS, you don't understand. I know this neighbor. I was raised in this neighborhood. I know where I'm going. That's not the way to get there. Now, think about what a GPS is, a global, what, positioning satellite? Is that what it stands for? I don't know, it just opens up on my phone. I don't know what it is, right? But I know that it tells me the directions to go. And I argue with it. Now think about what it does. It's pinging data from a satellite in space, which knows my precise location and the location of every traffic accident, every, every traffic jam, every closed road, right? And it's telling me, hey, Brian, by the way, you might not want to go that way. That road is closed. And I'm looking at it going, Pfft. you ever done that? You ever lost an argument with a GPS? Where you're sitting in traffic, you're like, I should have listened to your GPS, I'm so sorry. (laughs) We're arguing with something that knows a lot more about where we're going than we do. Now let's shift that to God. A lot of us doubt God knows what he's doing. Doubt, it's a common thing. Loneliness, pain, and now doubt. And we argue with God. God, are you sure you know what you're doing here? Are you, now, God's like, I know where everything is. I know where you're going. God, are you sure? It doesn't seem right. That job, man, that was supposed to be my job. I don't know. God, are you, are you snoozing? What's going on here? Do you not know where you're? God's like, I know where you're, you're going. I, I know what I'm doing. We start to doubt. God, I put this in the notes. Everyone has times of doubt. Everyone has times of doubt. King David did as well. Psalm 13, 1. Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? David's like, okay God, I'm here. Where did you go? He didn't doubt that God existed. He doubted that God cared. A lot of us do too. Because we keep hitting that same wall in our life. God, where are you? God, what's going on? God, why won't you help me here? Sometimes it happens in our prayer life. You ever pray and feel like it just bounces off the ceiling? I do. I've had moments like that where I've been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and going, God, where are you? God, where, you know, I don't, I don't hear from you. I don't, but let me, let me give you this truth. This is what I discovered. God answers every prayer. God answers every prayer. Psalm 66, 20, David again, praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. David's saying, hey, God, I know you hear my prayer. Thank you for answering it. God answers prayer in one of three ways. Number one, yes. And man, we love when God says yes. Don't you? Yes. 
And then sometimes God says what? No. I don't like hearing no from God, do you? Hey, but here, it's, at least it's an answer. At least it's an answer, okay? I don't like it, but I can live with it. Then he gives us, there's a third thing that God gives us. Wait. Now, this isn't like, this isn't like we'll see. How many parents in the room? Parents, 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 parents. Parents, you ever pull the we'll see thing on your kids? What does we'll see mean in parents speak? It means no. It's just a delayed no, so you don't have to have the meltdown in Walmart. You can have it in the car, right? <laughs> this is not the wait God's talking about here. This is a wait because I have something better for you type of wait. Pastor Johnny talked about this last week. Thank God he hasn't given me everything I've ever asked for. Man, God is so good. But I doubt him so much from time to time. And I wrestle with that. Especially if I don't get the answer I want. When you don't give your kids the answer they want, what do they do? They throw a little temper tantrum, don't they? Does it mean you don't love them? No, you love them so much you're willing to tell them no because you know that if they, you told them yes, it would hurt them. So when God says no or wait, it's not because he wants to, to, to make you struggle and feel challenged and doubt. He's telling you no or wait because he loves you so much. I've got something better for you, God says. But he's the one. No, he's not. Oh, but that school's the one I have to go to. Nope. Sometimes God says, wait, I have something better for you. God's no's are just as loving as his yeses. Here's the second truth about doubt. God's timing is always perfect. God's timing is always perfect. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Wonderful verse. God has a pathway for your life. Don't you wish he'd light the whole thing up at one time? Here you go. Here's the road for you. Great. I'll just go right down your road, God. God doesn't work that way, does he? How much of the road does God light up? One brick at a time, doesn't he? And sometimes that brick takes a little while to warm up. I want to know, God, what you want me to do. All you need to do, God, is tell me and I'll do it. God says, I'm going to light up the pathway in your life one step at a time. It's going to take faith to stand here and be faithful here. And when you're faithful here, I'll light up the next step. You need to be faithful here. But in, in the meantime, we doubt God knows what he's doing, but he absolutely does. He loves us so much, he lights that pathway up one step at a time. Now, here's what I put in my notes. It's not in in the notes or the screens. I wrote it this way. Faith isn't about knowing exactly what's about to happen in your life. It's knowing that God is already there preparing the way. God is already past your next three decisions preparing the way. Is it gonna look exactly as we want it to? Maybe, maybe not. But we can trust him. Doubt is one of those things, if we're not careful, it creeps in and takes over. So, God is trustworthy. He has our best interests in mind. He has a path for our life. Whether we're lonely, in pain, or we have doubt about God, I want to remind you something that this song talks about throughout. Here comes the sun, and it's going to be all right. Some of you, some of us, some of you online at Everglades have been in the darkness a long time in that storm and maybe we've gone through some pain or loneliness or doubt about God but that sun is coming back out the light is coming back three final thoughts number one you are not alone God will always be there number two your pain has a purpose you may not know it now but it will be revealed And number three, God is really there and you can trust him. Familia, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to remind you of a few final thoughts. Number one, Christ heals the hurting. 1 Peter 5.10 And the God of all grace will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Isaiah 40.31 But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. God patches up the heart. Psalm 147.3 He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. If you came today brokenhearted, God heals. 
And as we just sang about just a few minutes ago, we serve a God of hope. Don't ever give up on yourself, on others, or more importantly, God. Immediately, Jesus reaches down and rescues us from the pain and the loneliness and the struggle. And if you don't feel it yet, don't give up, it's coming. Psalm 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? Why should I fear? There's no need to be afraid anymore. God is there. If you came in today lonely, hurting, doubtful about God, maybe you're just checking this whole God thing out. I want to remind you that we serve a God of light. The sun comes back out. The clouds part. God heals. Are you ready for some light in your life? We serve an amazing, loving God of hope. I will be praying for you as you go through this. And we'll all be celebrating with you when that sun comes back out. Let's